For the past two years, one of the most powerful data tools I've used to show brands how they can find their audience in the real world has actually been a commercial real estate platform called Placer.ai. And uh, you might be familiar with Placer for one reason or another. Most commonly, I see real estate teams from place-based media companies using Placer as a tool to help them understand where to put screens. And uh, got the opportunity to to join an invite-only conference yesterday in New York with the Placer team and uh, specifically the commercial real estate community. Um, and I didn't, I didn't know, uh, what, what I could, what I could necessarily learn from commercial real estate, but I went in optimistic and really excited to be there. And it was a small kind of romantic private little event on, uh, on Chelsea pier, just one pier down from where the DPAA event was, uh, back in October, if, if you were there. And, um, what was so interesting about it was, was how similar the conversation is amongst commercial real estate types and what they care about when developing physical real estate and how that translates to what brands care about, care about when they're investing in physical real estate, i.e. out of home, i.e. targeted offline marketing, things like billboards, buses, bus shelters, that sort of stuff. Uh, so what I what I wanted to do was kind of take all of my notes yesterday and and condense it down into uh, into an episode here, so I could recap some of what uh, what I took away from that conversation and that I think is particularly relevant for 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 what we do. So uh, to give you a little bit more background on on who Placer is and what they do specifically to make the rest of the the, the notes make sense, I've just got a a few opening thoughts here. So. Um, yeah, so you might know who Placer is. Again, if you're a place-based media company, you might even be using their tools. Um, but specifically, they help commercial real estate investors, developers, builders understand things like where are customers of specific businesses or of certain retail outlets? Where do they work? Which roads do they take to get to and from? Um, where are the places that they're spending time in between? Right? What's their what's their real world physical journey look like? And what that means for a brand is that the real world is just as, if not more deterministically targeted than ads on the internet, because what's so important about commercial real estate data is that it's not used for the purpose of serving ads online. It's just used for commercial real estate purposes to understand, hey, you know, we're going to close down this road. Where where should we run the detours? Or, hey, I'm a developer and I want to put in a new Starbucks. So the property type that I'm looking for has to fit a certain type of a, a parameter. Why it ultimately matters for two reasons. First is if you're a brand, if you're advising a brand that's sold in a retail store, or you're working with a brand that has retail stores, maybe they are the retailer themselves, or let's just say that it's a D2C brand that wants to target specific customers of a certain brick and mortar retailer, then this really becomes one of the most powerful data sets that you could have at your disposal for picking where in the real world you should advertise. And I'm not just talking the market here. Uh, in fact, I covered this pretty extensively in the LinkedIn Live event that I hosted last week. So I'll make sure to link to that in the show notes. I'll link to the replay so you can go watch it for yourself. And, and I talk about these things. But specifically, having Placer is like having a mil military intelligence team on the ground for your brand in the markets that matter most to you. They're able to tell you which roads people take, other places that they spend time and money, where they work out, where they get their groceries, where do they do their shopping, et cetera. The second reason is that if you're a brand sold in retail or you have retail stores or you are that D2C brand, why wouldn't you just use the same tools that billions of dollars in physical real estate investment decisions are already being made with? It's literally what the platform is designed for, to give commercial real estate folks the confidence to invest in physical real estate, or in some cases, divest or sell to get out from underperforming locations. So it's how major retail chain products, you know, it's, it's how major retail uh, chains are determining where to put their stores. And if your product is sold in their store, then why wouldn't you just use the same data to inform the real world targeted offline marketing campaign? It's the same data that's being used by huge multinational retail conglomerates. Um, and, and that's you know one of the first things that I took away is that as big and as powerful as that data is, it's really become democratized. And that means that now anyone 
can have access to the to the things that were typically reserved for just big companies like Target and Walmart and Amazon that have big data science teams. So one of the first hot takes from the morning panel of speakers, I really loved this. Brands that survived the last two years are going to be around for the next 100 years. Uh, and one of the reasons is actually pretty like it's pretty primal. And and, and when the, when it was said out loud, I was like, oh, yeah, that that makes sense. Duh. And that is that the retail experience is inherent to human behavior. It's just something that we've been doing since the beginning of time, going to the bazaar, going out physically buying things. It's 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 inherent to the human experience. And what we're seeing traffic wise is that retail foot traffic and sales are back to 2019 levels. Um, but hiring and staffing still remains one of the primary challenges for retail. And because of how the retail landscape has been impacted the last two years, landlords and store owners have adapted. And uh, and and really what that's created is a, is a competitive advantage for brands leaning into having a physical storefront, having a physical presence. Um Creative deal making was one of the uh, one of the main themes here. In that, the last two years has taught landlords and tenants alike that, hey, sometimes we just got to be creative and getting a deal done because, you know, like if there's a lockdown and I can't open my store, well, I shouldn't have to pay rent because I'm not selling stuff. So, creative deal making, um, it seems, is a real advantage for folks that might be uh, considering physical real estate for the first time or downsizing from a huge, huge footprint, maybe into something smaller. So because of that, I think there's an opportunity to use retail as a growth hack. And uh, one of the one of the highlights was kind of on the perfect brand for unlocking retail growth. But specifically, what, uh, what the community is seeing is that new chains you know, have just as much information as the established stalwarts had, uh, you know, have had for years, but that there's this meaty middle, if you will, of, of folks that haven't, that didn't quite have the scale to have a data science team and are a little bit slow to the data adoption game. So really what that's opened up is like, Hey, the top 1% of retailers are just going to keep crushing it, but that there's an opportunity. There's a window for these challenger type brands to step in and uh, and really create a, a significant impact for themselves. So the brands that they see really leaning into retail growth as a as as a hack for for growing the brand, that they currently have five locations that are opening twenty plus a year. A huge shift to mobile commerce, the opportunity to buy online, pick up in store, ship from the store. Uh, mobile commerce coming more popular over the last two years. They said that that really accelerated. Uh, the adoption of of technology like that. So you combine combine that with the fundamentals changing in commercial real estate, creativity and deal making. It really could be a great opportunity for a born online brand to become a real world retailer. Um, what retailers are are doing specifically to find success for themselves is that they are spending as close to the point of purchase. They're spending as close to uh, that 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 retail location during the highest moments of consideration. They're using data for personalizing the retail experience, right? Different stores reach different audiences. So they're using audience insights and shopping behaviors to create a personalized experience that's unique to that store in that market. That could come down to the assortment of product. That could come down to pricing and packaging. That could... Uh, you know, just be the benefits of coming in person to the store, ultimately asking the question, what is the job to be done? That was a theme paramount throughout this entire day and this entire conversation or two panels. Um, I have this note here too. We talked about the retail experience being inherent to the, to the human behavior, to inherent to human behavior. Um, but what is most interesting is that going to the mall has become a leisure activity. I remember when going to the mall was just the thing you did after school and you went and hung out with your friends in the food court. Um, it is a much more high in t- high intent activity uh, than it has been traditionally. When shoppers are coming, they're coming to spend. They're not coming to shop. So retailers are thinking about how do we create the most high dwell environment as possible. And that's why you see more multi, multi-use properties popping up. It's a lifestyle center. It's a live, shop, work, play kind of, uh, kind of environment. And when it comes to the battle of e-commerce versus brick and mortar, the major retail players are declaring that the war is over. 
Uh, and the reason for that is because of mobile commerce leading the way and bridging the offline online relationship that we have with brands we love. At the end of the day, e-commerce is always just going to be a share of retail sales and how it's being measured. It you know, depends who you're asking. If you're asking Shopify, how much is the is e-commerce as a percentage of retail sales? sales that's going to be different than if you're asking, uh, you know, uh, Westgate and, and asking them how much is that percentage. So that's going to co- probably continue to be a dispute. But the major retailers, they are uh, accepting that, hey, e-commerce, it's going to be a share of our sales overall. Once upon a time, I thought this was interesting. Once upon a time, uh, commercial real estate developers weren't even allowing um, the business to put the URL on their physical store. Think about that. That's almost crazy, right? Like Target wants to open a store, uh, you know, wherever, maybe 15 years ago. They weren't allowed to put www.target.com anywhere on that building. So it's interesting to see how. You know, there was very much an intentional effort to to stall it, but now we've kind of all gotten to the place where it makes sense. All this stuff just works together. We just have to we have to create the best shopper experience. So uh, the war is over. E commerce versus brick and mortar. That's what the major retailers are saying. Here, here's a really interesting stat: online visits were down on Black Friday and Saturday, but the average order value is up. And they're attributing that to more effective offline discovery for brands. Shoppers are coming with a clear sense of what they want to accomplish online. And uh, this year, more than ever before, they saw more purchases made with buy now, pay later, and pay over time options. So concerning when you pay attention to you know, the federal interest rate and variable uh, variable debt payments and things like that, concerning uh, that Americans continue to spend uh, you know beyond our means, but optimistic outlook that average order value is up on Black Friday, despite online visits being down. So mobile commerce, that's really the focus for physical retailers. They want to create a win-win-win for customers, buy online, pick up in the store, ship from the store, return in store. Researching return policies is one of the top trending consumer search behaviors. That was a I thought that was interesting. Folks are really looking for the ability to to buy and have the flexibility online, but they want to have a physical relationship with uh, with the brands that they're buying from. The commercial real estate side, they're really thinking specifically about how do we create ad revenue from our physical properties. The mention of retail media networks was was a common th- theme throughout. Uh, but the the commercial real estate side, they're thinking the same way the internet thinks about websites. How do we get people here? How do we get them to stay? And how do we get them to engage? Uh, experiential, I think that the the one team from Westgate said uh, that experiential was up like 600% in the last 12 months. So more brands taking advantage of audiences being there physically in person. And uh, And I loved this one. This was from the second panel. One well, of the women said, "We're data rich, but insights poor," and uh, and and it was really to stress the importance of we've got all the data in the world, and we can help brands to understand whatever it is they need to understand. But we need insights from the brand to answer the question: What is the job to be done? So it is still that 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 harmonious relationship between brand, between advisor, between consultant. Um, and how you can use the data that you have combined with the data that the brand has to make the best decisions for the the highest probability outcome uh, that they're looking to achieve. There was a good story about how Lululemon was considering a brand kind of mashup partnership with uh, with another athletic wear brand, and that they used this type of data to determine which is the better better brand for us to do this partnership with. I'm not sure how long ago this was, but uh, it, this was Lululemon. They were looking at Fabletics to do some sort of mashup with. And after they analyzed the data, it turned out, wow, Athleta um, is a better brand for Lululemon to align with in terms of looking at the customers. So that's how you can use the data to inform decisions like that. But specifically, when we get down to brass tacks, we're trying to uh, trying to help brands understand where their audience is are how they move through the real world and where are the best opportunities to influence the behavior we care most about influencing. So data rich, insights poor, we still got to ask the question, what is the job to be done? What is the thing you are looking to accomplish? 
because all my data doesn't matter without it. So it's taking data from the brand, taking data that you have, taking data from outside data sources, putting it all together to come up with the best story that makes the most sense. It gives you the best opportunity for success. So one of my favorite moments of the day, though, was during uh, during the networking in the beginning uh, of the event. I met a real estate developer and he told me this awesome story about Walgreens. So I wanted to close with this. He was working on a commercial real estate deal and Walgreens specifically wants their parking lots to be in the front. And it makes sense. And there was so much psychology uh, exchanged at this event. It was really fascinating. But the reason that Walgreens wants a parking lot in the front is because they want customers to see other customers parked there for that physical social proof factor of, hey, other people are there. I should go there, too, for whatever the thing is that I need to go get. So Walgreens came into this market was really interested in this property, but only if they could put the parking lot in the front. And the gentleman who owned the property said, nope, no parking lot going in the front. You can do a parking lot in the back, but no parking lot in the front. And Walgreens threatened to walk away from the deal. And the gentleman who owned the land very confidently said to Walgreens, before there was a Walgreens, my family owned this land. And after Walgreens is gone, my family will still own this land. And I think that that is the key takeaway. There is only so much physical space. There is a finite amount of physical real estate. There's no replacement for ownership. And and I think that that's a great story of just how important it is. So if you found this episode to be helpful, please share it with somebody who could benefit. Make sure to smash that subscribe button. Leave a review. That's how you help the podcast grow. And if you're looking to write your next chapter in Out of Home, check out O-O-H-I-R-E-D.com. That's O-O-Hired.com. Or I got the URL O-O-H-Hired.com. So either one of those variations you type in is going to get you to the same place. That place is the first free community-powered career marketplace exclusively for jobs in Out of Home. So if you're ready to start writing your next chapter in Out of Home, a good place to start. That's O-O-H-I-R-E-D.com, double O-H-I-R-E-D-I-D.com or O-O-H-Hired.com. We'll see you next time.